Hi, fellow believers in Christ. Um, I want to share a couple of interesting <clears throat> verses with you. And one is Acts 10, 43. To this one do all, now this one, of course, is Jesus. Do all the prophets testify that through his name, everyone that is believing in him doth receive remission of sins. And, you know, Jesus told us that we have to believe in him. But this verse tells us the proof that we believe in him. If we believe in him, we will receive remission of sins. And remission, oops, not doing what I want it to do. Remission, the true meaning of remission that is in all the King James Bible and all the other older translations is abatement. Just like in hospitals, they know that remission means abatement. It means like as in um, remission of cancer that when doctors use the word correctly, because it does mean abatement of cancer. It doesn't mean your cancer is forgiven. It means your cancer has stopped. But in, Christi in modern Christianity, they've been misusing the word ever since basically Billy Graham um, started misusing it. And then all the other pastors started misusing it. And so now the dictionary and the, the newer translations like the NIV think that remission means forgiveness. And in the NIV, they actually put forgiveness in, in the Bible where it should say remission. But remission never meant forgiveness. It means abatement. So going back to that verse, if you believe in Jesus, you will, will receive abatement of your sins. And that is why we're able to be called righteous. You can't be called righteous if you're still sinning. God is not, he's not dumb. He doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. So when people are living in sin, he never calls people righteous. But because of Jesus' death on the cross, um, we, we now have a way in which we can actually become righteous. So... Um, moving on, in Acts 10, so, so, so Acts 10, 43 says that if you believe in Jesus, you will have abatement of your sins. So that is proof that you're a real believer. A lot of people say that they believe in Jesus Christ, but they don't believe in what he said, and they don't repent of their sins. And Jesus said all the time that we have to repent. If you don't believe what Jesus said, you're not really a believer in Jesus Christ. And so people who haven't repented of their sins are not really believers. So most people who think they're Christians are actually fake Christians. They never became Christians. They just became religious. And it's because of all the lives, lies that are in the modern church. But then there's another verse, Acts 13, 39, which says the same thing again. And from all things from which ye were not able in the law of Moses to be declared righteous. So in the law of Moses, the, in the Old Testament, they could never be declared righteous. They could be forgiven for their past sin, but they could never be declared righteous because they kept sinning. You see, that's why all of the, the patriarchs sinned. You know, David um, committed adultery and murder. Now, they didn't sin nonstop because they were seeking the Lord. So David didn't have a lifestyle of sin. His He had a lifestyle of seeking the Lord, but he did fall at one point into adultery and murder. Um, Noah fell into drunkenness. Um, Moses fell into murder, <laughs> you know, and Moses was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. So all these great, a lot of these great men, not all of them, but a lot of these great men did terrible sins at some point. They didn't have a lifestyle of sinning because they did love the Lord. But, but because they could never be fully righteous because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. And that is why they fell. And in modern churches, people use the patriarchs as an example of how we should live today. But the patriarchs are not the example of how we should live today because the patriarchs, were before Jesus died on the cross. They didn't have the grace of God that would make them righteous. So the next part of the verse is, in this everyone who is believing, in this one who is Jesus, everyone who is believing is declared righteous. And again, 
In churches today, they say, well, God declares you're righteous even when you sin because Jesus died on the cross. But that isn't what the Bible says. What the, and we'll see in the verses as we look further, what the Bible repeatedly says and shows us is that God doesn't declare you righteous unless you're actually righteous. He doesn't label sinners as righteous ever in the Old Testament or the New Testament. If you believe that God is in the is in the practice of labeling sinners as righteous because Jesus died on the cross, look at all the people in the Old and the New Testament. You won't find one person who God called righteous who was living in sin and practicing sin. You will not find one person. Um, so that's proof to you right there that God does not label the unrighteous righteous. But in the law of Moses, you no one could be labeled righteous because nobody had remission of sins through Jesus Christ. They only had forgiveness of sins if they repented. But in the new law, not only do you get forgiveness when you repent, but you also get righteousness because of Jesus. So I'm, I apologize in advance. This video is probably going to end up being really long because I'm going to go through all the prophets that I could find who actually said something in the Bible. There's three prophets in the New Testament who I couldn't find what they had actually said, Judas, Silas, and Agabus. But the prophets in the Old Testament, um, I did look in the Bible and find out what they said and when they talked about righteousness and prophesying Jesus. So I've, well, we'll go through it. So David was actually a prophet, even though he, some people weren't called prophets because they didn't, that wasn't their main gift or their main calling, but they still prophesied at different times in their life. So David prophesied in Psalms 46 through eight, he says, sacrifice and present thou hast not desired ears. Thou hast prepared for me burnt and sin offerings thou hast not asked. So in the Old Testament, the people did the offerings and the sacrifices, but God didn't want that. He wanted the people to be righteous. Then said I, lo, have I, lo, I have come in the role of the book it is written of me. Now this is Jesus talking through David's prophesying about Jesus. To do thy pleasure, my God, I have delighted and thy law is within my heart. So Jesus has the law of the Father in his heart, and that's why Jesus does the law of the Father. And David um, had the law in his heart too, but in a lesser way because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. But still, that was David's longing, and he was prophesying about the Christ to come. So because of Jesus, we can have the law written in our heart, and that's what the New Testament talks about as well. Um so when you have the law written in your heart, you stop sinning. You see how he says, I don't want your sacrifice. I want you to stop sinning. Okay, Samuel, um, Psalm 99, 4 and 6. And the strength of the king hath loved judgment. Thou, thou hast established uprightness, which is righteousness, judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Thou hast done. Exalt ye Jehovah our God and bow yourselves at his footstool. Holy is he. So holy and righteous are kind of the same thing. And he has established righteousness. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those proclaiming his name. Whose name? That would be Jesus. It's really talking about Jesus. They are calling unto Jehovah and he doth answer them. Because of the righteousness that Jesus gives us, this is also a prophecy about Jesus. When we call on Jehovah, he will answer. And you know in the Old Testament, anytime, and in the New Testament as well, anytime people are practicing sin, God does not answer their prayer. And in fact, in the New Testament, James says, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So when God isn't answering your prayer, it's one of two things. Either it's a test as Job was going through, or in most cases, it's because you are sinning. And that's what it's talking about here. In Job um, 2, verse 3, And Jehovah saith unto the adversary, Hast thou set thy heart unto my servant Job, because there is none like him in the land, a man perfect and upright, fearing God and turning aside from evil? And still he is keeping hold on his integrity, and thou dost move me against him to swallow him up for naught. So here, God is basically saying that Job is perfect and righteous. Um, now, Jesus hadn't come yet, so there's no way that Job was 
never sinned in his entire life. In fact, the Bible tells us in the beginning of the book of Job that Job gave sacrifices not only for himself, but also for his children. So he wouldn't have given sacrifices for his own self if he hadn't have had some sort of sin in his heart. But it was always his will and his constant um, um, striving to please the Lord and never sin. So Job wasn't absolutely perfect, but he was probably about as perfect <laughs> as anybody who's lived has ever been before Jesus Christ, um, because he was constantly striving and he was confessing his sin because that's what you do when you give a sacrifice, you confess your sin. So he did have sins, but he didn't have a lifestyle of sin. And God actually calls him perfect because I think God is somewhat comparing him to other people on the earth who absolutely don't care if they sin or not. And Job wasn't anything like that. He did always did his best to go above and beyond, um, you no, know, trying to avoid sin. But anyway, there I couldn't really find any part in the book of Job that directly the the one part that does talk about Jesus talks about Jesus being a mediator between God and man. But this part of Job talks about how important righteousness is to the Lord. And so we can see and that that relates to Jesus as well because righteousness is everything. You cannot you you can't be saved without being righteous. And read the New Testament and you'll see that very clearly. And the Old Testament too, really. Okay, Solomon, 1 Kings 2, 8, 32. Now again, Solomon wasn't known as a prophet, but he prophesied like a lot of people did who weren't known as prophets. Then thou dost hear in the heavens and hast done and hast judged thy servants to declare wicked the wicked. See how God declares wicked the wicked? He doesn't declare righteous the wicked. He doesn't declare the wicked righteous. He declares the wicked wicked because God is a just God and he's an intelligent God. He's not an idiot. God didn't become stupid because his son died on the cross. He, he still knows right from wrong. OK, a lot of preachers want you to think that God doesn't know right from wrong anymore and that he just looks at Jesus every time we sin. No, no, no. He, God is not a codependent. He's not an idiot or a doormat. He declares the wicked, wicked. He doesn't declare wicked, righteous. And then here, to put his way on his head and to declare righteous, the righteous, to give him according to his righteousness. So God awards us life according to our righteousness. And he only declares you righteous if you really are righteous. He doesn't play games. He doesn't, he doesn't play games like we try to do with him. He doesn't play games with us. If we're not righteous, he'll declare us wicked. And if we are righteous, he'll declare us righteous. Okay. Elijah, 1 Kings 18, 37 to 39. Answer me, O Jehovah, answer me. And this people doth know that thou art Jehovah God, and thou hast turned their heart backward. Now, normally you would think backward means turning them to sin. But in this passage, if you read the whole passage, you'll see that what it's really talking about is turning their heart back to God, meaning turning their heart back to righteousness. And there falleth the fire of Jehovah and consumeth the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and the water that is in the trench it hath licked up. See, the fire of God is a holy fire. It's a consuming fire and it burns out the chaff and the demons and all the bad stuff that's in our lives. Okay. And all the people see and fall on their faces and say, Jehovah, he is the God. Jehovah, he is the God. So this is the story where Elijah proved that Jehovah was the true God because God accepted his sacrifice in, in an amazing way and didn't accept the other sacrifice to the demon God. But what I want you to focus on is the wording here. He turns their heart backward, meaning to repentance. Then he sends his holy fire to cleanse them cleanse their hearts, then they fall on their faces and they worship him. See how that's a natural progression. You cannot worship and serve the God before you've been cleansed. You cannot be cleansed before you have repented. First repentance in verse 37, verse 38 is cleansing, verse 39 is serving the Lord. 
Okay. And there's no games we can play with that. A lot of people think you go to church and you're serving the Lord as soon as you walk in the door because you're there and he should be so grateful that you arrived at church on Sunday morning. No, if you're living in sin, he doesn't, he doesn't care where you are on Sunday morning. He, he's, he cares, he's, he's upset because you're sinning, really. Showing up at church at, you know, 930 in the morning doesn't change the fact that you're still a sinner. Okay. So you repent first, then he cleanses you, and then you can serve him. Elisha, 2 Kings 4, 3 through 7. And he saith, go ask for the vessels from without, from all thy neighbors, empty vessels. Let them not be a few. This is the story where the poor widow, he told her to fill up all her empty vessels and that they would all become oil that she could pay off her debts with and then live off the rest of the oil. Um, so, and thou hast poured out into all these vessels and the full ones thou dost remove. And it cometh to pass at the filling of the vessels that she cometh and declareth to the man of God. And he saith, go sell the oil and repay thy loan and thou and thy sons do live off the rest. So this is kind of a metaphor for the fact that oil in the Bible, you know how the 10 virgins, there was the five wise and the five foolish virgins. The five foolish virgins did not keep the oil in their lamp. And the oil is the Holy Spirit. And when you're walking and following the Holy Spirit, walking with and following the Holy Spirit, you he keeps you in the path of righteousness so that you don't sin. So the oil represents, it represents the Holy Spirit, which is if you have the Holy Spirit, you have a life without, without sin. So her loan is repaid. Her debt is repaid because that's her represents her past sin is repaid because now she walks in righteousness and her and her sons live off the rest, meaning she can continue forward in righteousness. It's just, this is a metaphor. Okay. And it's a metaphor of the Christian life in Jesus Christ. Not only do you repent of your past sin and then your debts are paid through the blood of Jesus Christ, but then you go on in righteousness going forward still with the oil. She was she ended up with more oil to live on than the oil she had used to pay her debts. Do you understand that? And that's how it is with Christians too. In Daniel chapter 9:24, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin put an end to sin. Now, why would God want us to put an end to sin? Because he hates sin. He's always hated sin. He will not um, have a relationship with people in sin. And he, there's no sinners allowed in heaven. So that's why we need to put an end to sin. And that's why God himself puts an end to sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. To atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Who brings in everlasting righteousness? That's Jesus. Okay to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Where is the most holy place in your life? It's in your spirit because your because you your your spirit is in your temple, right? So the sanctuary of your temple is your spirit. The temple is your body. Inside the temple is the sanctuary, the most holy place, your spirit. And it must be anointed it must have everlasting righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ. But how do you get there? First of all, there has to be an end to the sin in your life. So again, first sin comes to an end. Then you will have everlasting righteousness with Christ and your sanctuary will be sanctified. Because shouldn't your sanctuary be sanctified? And it will be a most holy place, not a wicked place. So again, this is like a metaphor here. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 23 through 28. And I have sanctified my great name that is profaned among nations that ye have polluted in your midst and known have the nations that I am Jehovah an affirmation of the Lord Jehovah in my being sanctified in you before your eyes. Look at the words in you. Mm hmm. That sounds like Jesus alive in you. So this is about Jesus coming to the in the future as well. You can't be sanctified unless Jesus is in you. And I have taken you out of the nations and have gathered you out of all the lands and have brought you into your land. Now, spiritually, 
when we become Christians, we get taken out of the nations, meaning out of the world, okay, spiritually out of, you come out of the world, you're in the world, but you're not of it anymore. So you spiritually come out of the world and you, he brings you home to possess your own land, which again is your temple. And I've sprinkled over you clean water. That's cleansing. You first, you come out of the world, which is repentance. Then you get cleansed and ye have been clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I cleanse you and I have given to you a new heart. Isn't that what Jesus said he would do? He would give us a new heart, take away our heart of stone and give us a new heart. So this is Jesus and a new spirit I give in your midst. Okay, so this is a spirit that is with the Lord, walking with the Lord, not in rebellion. And I have turned aside the heart of stone from your flesh. And that's what Jesus said. And I have given to you a heart of flesh and my spirit I give in your midst. And I have done this so that in my statutes you walk. Oh, my goodness, does God really want us to walk in his statutes? Yes, he does. Not like they say at church, because at church they say, well, you're never going to quit sinning. But Jesus is okay with that. That's why he died on the cross. No, full. That's not true at all. God wants us to walk in his statutes and my judgments ye keep and have done them. So this means that we are actually doing the will of the Lord. We're actually obeying him. And ye have dwelt in the land that I have given to your fathers and ye have been to me for a people and I, I am to you for God. So we're not his people and he's not our God unless we're actually obeying him and keeping his statutes. This land is not just us possessing our own temple and spirit without the demons there, but it's also the land to come when we go to heaven. We'll possess the land in heaven, the promised land. It, but, but again, we have to be his people to get there. So in Isaiah um, 40, three through four, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain. Okay, so we all know Jesus told us the straight and narrow way is a way without sin. Okay, and that's what Isaiah is prophesying here. There will be a way that is not the way of sin. When he's saying everything is become going to become straight and flat and narrow, he means that he he means that our he, God, the people of God, will be cleansed of their sin and they'll stop sinning. That's what this represents. This is a metaphor again, representing the people turning back to the Lord and giving up their sins. So straight in the desert. So we walk in a wilderness spiritually. When we become saved, we walk in a wilderness where the Lord prunes us. But you can't walk in that wilderness until you first are on the straight and narrow path. Remember, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days before he began his ministry. And, and that's a cleansing time where you resist the devil and he flees from you. Okay, that's the beginning of your life with, with Christ. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days before God gave him the Ten Commandments. Okay. Um, Moses, Acts 3, 20 through 23. And this is quoting one of the books, um, either one of the one of the books of, that Moses wrote. It could be Deuteronomy. I'm not sure which one it is. Then wonderful times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will send Jesus, your Messiah, to you again. For he must remain in heaven until the time of the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his prophets. Moses said, now this is the part where it's a quote from the Old Testament. The Lord your, your God will raise up a prophet like me, and that's Jesus, from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. So Christians who claim that they believe in Jesus, but they don't listen to and follow what he said, they don't really believe. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be cut off from God's people and utterly destroyed. So if we aren't obeying what Jesus said, we will be cut off from God's people and utterly destroyed. We will go to hell if we are not obeying what Jesus said. Righteousness is a requirement. And again, God doesn't look at your sin and see Jesus. That is a total lie straight from the pit of hell that's been taught in American churches for many de uh, decades now. And it is a lie straight from Satan because nowhere in the Bible does it say that. 
when God looks at your sin, he sees sin and he hates it. Okay, that's what the Bible says. And it, here it's saying anyone who does not listen to Jesus, which is that prophet, will be cut off from God's people and utterly destroyed. So what did Jesus tell us to do? He told us to walk the straight and narrow. He told us to repent of our sins. He told us that we even look at somebody with lust. We've already committed adultery. He told us that if you commit one sin, you've broken them all. You've broken all the commandments. So we have to listen to him and, and obey. If you're not obeying, you're not listening, right? When your parents tell you to clean your room, if you don't clean your room, that counts as not listening, doesn't it? So if we don't do what Jesus said, that counts as not listening. And Jacob, Genesis 49, 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs, that's Jesus, shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. So again, this is saying, Jacob is prophesying that Jesus will cause the whole world all those who follow him in the world to obey him, not just the Jews, but all the nations who follow him. They will obey him. Very clearly stated. If you're not obeying Jesus, you're not following him. Jesus, in Luke 24, 46 through 48, and he said to them, Thus it hath been written, and thus it, hath, it was behooving the Christ to suffer and to rise out of the dead the third day. And reformation, which is repentance, and remission, which is abatement of sins to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Look at this. Repentance and abatement of sins. Very clearly stated. The, these, wor these words don't mean anything else. I know Billy Graham told you they meant something different, but Billy Graham was lying. Okay. He was lying. They mean exactly what they say. Reformation has always meant repentance and remission has always meant abatement. John the Baptist, Mark 1 through 4, 1, 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of reformation. That's repentance to remission of sins, meaning that if you repent, then you can get remission of sins, meaning abatement of sins. So the first step is repentance. The next step is abatement of sins, meaning you no longer sin. So if you're a Christian and you were taught that you can repent every week, you were taught wrong because once you repent of that sin, you don't go back to it. Okay, we still have to confess our sins on a regular basis because new things will come up and the devil will put thoughts in our head that we might entertain for too long and different stuff like that. But you don't go back to your old old lifestyle. You don't go back to the old sins. You don't keep committing adultery every week or keep fornicating every week. You don't do that. If you're a Christian, you don't you you have remission of sins, which means you stop sinning. You have, but first you have to reform, which means repent. And the whole point of reforming, it says to remission of sins, meaning that's the whole point of reforming is that you're going to stop sinning. If you do the same sin over and over, you've never repented. That's what this verse is telling us, because the whole point of, re of repenting is to remission of sins. It's kind of like if you turn the key in the ignition, that the vehicle is going to start, okay? <laughs> and people who think that they're repenting every week of the same sins, they never put the key in the ignition, okay? It's all talk. If, if they had actually put the key in the ignition, the vehicle would have started. They'd be living a new life, but they're not living a new life. So it's just talk. It's empty talk. Habakkuk 3.13 Thou hast gone forth for the salvation of thy people, for salvation with thine anointed. That's Jesus. Jesus is the anointed one, as the Bible tells us. Thou hast smitten the head of the house of the wicked, laying bare the foundation unto the neck. Pause. I don't know why the pause is there. Um, but look at that. God has smitten the head of the house of the wicked. So what does God do to the wicked? He smites them. He doesn't call them righteous. Okay. 
and the anointed one brings salvation to the people. So here Habakkuk is prophesying Jesus Christ. And while he's prophesying Jesus Christ, he says that God will smite the wicked. So people who continue to practice sin will are in the smited category. They're not in the righteous category. Sorry. Amos um, 9, Amos 9, 10 through 12. By sword die do all sinners of my people who are saying, not overtake or go before for our sakes doth evil. In that day, I raised the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and I have repaired their breaches. A breach is like a trespass or a sin. I have repaired their trespasses, and its ruins I do raise up. When you sin, your, your, your spirit is in ruins. Your soul is in ruins, but he raises you up. And I have built it up as in the days of old, so that they possess the remnant of Edom. Edom represents... Um, the nations that don't follow God and all the nations on whom my name is called an affirmation of Jehovah doer of this. So again, it says that if you're a sinner, you will die. Now it says by the sword, but that again, it's like a metaphor for any kind of death, you know, um, sinners die. Sinners don't have everlasting life. It's interesting. It says the sinners are saying not overtake or go before for our sakes doth evil. That kind of reminds me of Christians in church who say, you know, God will, God won't bring evil to us because we go to church. But really, if you're, if you're a sinner, God will bring evil to you. It's called hell. <laughs> hell, hell is an evil place. It's not good. It's made by God, but in the Bible, evil is anything that's that's not that we don't want, anything that we don't like, anything that doesn't benefit us. It doesn't mean that God is malicious, but uh, in the Bible, God calls. The Bible says that God brings evil, but it doesn't mean that he's malicious It mean, or that he is evil. It's just that it's kind of like if you fall down, it's evil. You know, if you fall down and scrape your knee, it's evil because it's not good for you. So anything God does that, that isn't good for us is evil um, in the sense of punishment. But we deserve it. If we go to hell, we deserve it because we're sinners. So sorry, I keep doing that. So Joel in Joel 2, 23, And ye sons of Zion, joy and rejoice in Jehovah your God, for he hath given to you the teacher, that's Jesus, for righteousness because jesus taught righteousness and he causeth to come down to you a shower sprinkling and gathered in the beginning so this is like a shower of blessing when you have when the teacher teaches you righteousness you walk in it you don't you know when when your teacher at school teaches you that two plus two equals four then from that point on you know that two plus two equals four you can count better right when they teach you all the numbers and how to count you don't forget what they taught you if you, if you forget what you're taught, you're not, you haven't learned anything in the first place. So when the teacher teaches righteousness, those who he's teaching actually will walk in righteousness. It's not, it's not a slogan or a byword. It's a reality. So you walk in it. When the teacher teaches, you walk in it. You don't forget. And that's what brings down the shower of blessing, which is spiritual blessing. So John, 1 John 3, 8, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So Christians who go to church and, and live in sin every week, they're of the devil. It doesn't matter if they go to church. That doesn't change the fact that they're of the devil. Um, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Now, I'm not saying that I'm without sin because a lot of people will go, oh, she's claiming she's without sin. No, I'm not because I, I sinned greatly before I became born again. But when you're after you're born again, you you give up that old life. And in fact, you can't even become born again until you repent of the old life. You repent first, then you become born again. <laughs> so so now I I walk in repentance and I have to keep doing that in order to keep maintaining my salvation. First John 1 John 1.9, 
Um, if we may confess our sins, steadfast he is and righteous that he may forgive us our sins and may cleanse us from every unrighteousness. So Jesus does more than just forgive. When we confess and repent, he does more than just forgive. In the Old Testament, they always got forgiveness, you know, when they confess their sins. But Jesus cleanses us from all the filth and so that we can now walk in righteousness. He cleanses us from every unrighteousness, which would cause you to be righteous. If you don't have any unrighteousness in you, you're righteous, right? <laughs> so Jesus makes us righteous. And here it is. It's being said again. He doesn't, he doesn't forgive sinners. I mean, we all have sinned and fallen short. But if you're still a practicing sinner, he doesn't forgive you. You have to repent. Then you get cleansed and then you're made righteous. But you have to continue walking in that righteousness. It's only through faith. You can't do it through willpower. That's another thing is some people might think, oh, she's teaching work salvation because she's saying that you have to earn your salvation by being righteous. No, I'm teaching grace because the grace of God is a gift that enables you to have the faith to believe that you've denied yourself and that Jesus Christ is alive inside of you. And that is what keeps you from sin. Willpower will never keep you from sin. So it's not willpower is works, is, is the evil works of the flesh. But faith is the works of Jesus Christ in you. And that it does keep you from sin. Because if you're not kept from sin, you're not, you're not redeemed. That's your proof that you're not redeemed. In Job 19.25, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Now, a Redeemer... Obviously, Job is talking about Jesus. A redeemer is one who saves us from sin. And again, this is in the dictionary, but the dictionary also has the false, the false interpretations as well that have come from all the Billy Graham teachings that have come down through the decades that have infiltrated all the churches so that people don't even know what being redeemed means. They think that being redeemed means you continue sinning and God just ignores it, you know. That is not being redeemed. No, when you're redeemed, he, he redeems you into his family. Is his family a family of sinners? No. Do angels go around sinning? No, they live in heaven because they don't go around sinning. The demons do not live in heaven because they walk in sin. Do you understand that? So if we continue in sin, we're going to end up where the demons are in hell. We aren't going to end up in heaven. There's no sinners in heaven right now. And there never will be. We have to understand that. If angels aren't sinning, that explains to us why we have to be righteous too in order to go where they are. Okay? Heaven is a righteous place. It's a perfect place. It's not another earth where sinners are dwelling. Heaven is not another earth. <laughs> so Ezra 7, 9, and 10. For on the first of the month, he hath founded the ascent from Babylon. I didn't take time to look this up, but I think it's talking about, um, there's a tradition in Judaism, and it's in the Psalms of Ascent that are in the Old Testament, where it's kind of like these steps that lead higher and higher and higher, and they're physical steps. They're in, they're in um, Jerusalem, and they lead higher and higher up to, I think, maybe the temple. I'm not really sure. Um, but Ezra located these steps because the Babylonians had come and destroyed the temple and 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 took uh, stole all the things out of the temple. But because Ezra followed the Lord, the Lord showed him where the stones of ascent were, so that he could then show the people where these. It's kind of like he found the ruins that nobody had been able to see. So anyway. For on the first of the month he hath founded the ascent from Babylon, and on the first of the of the fifth month he hath come in unto Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra hath prepared his heart to seek the law of, jo of Jehovah, and to do and to teach in Israel statute and judgment. So the reason Ezra was able <coughs> to found the the stones of ascent, I think that's what this is talking about. I could be wrong, but I think. I think that's what it's talking about. But the reason he was able to do this service to the people and, and the Lord 
was because his heart was already in the right place. So again, that goes back to the fact that you can't serve God until you're following him. So all these people in church every Sunday who think they're serving God because they're doing all the stuff that the pastor tells them to do, but they're really living in sin every week. They're not serving God at all. They're just not serving him at all. You can't serve God until you become one of his children. You can you can perform at church if you all you want. You can perform in the choir and you can perform in, as a Sunday school teacher and you can perform as an usher and you can perform as a greeter. But none of that is service to the Lord if you have sin in your life on a weekly basis. But because Ezra, he um, he he prepared his heart to seek the law, to follow the law, seeking it. He wouldn't be seeking it if he wasn't following it and to do and to teach in Israel the statute and judgment. So not only was Ezra following the law himself, but he was teaching others to follow it. And because of that, he was able to serve the Lord. <laughs> Nehemiah 1, 5 and 9. O Jehovah, God of the heavens, God, the great and the fearful, keeping the covenant and kindness for who? For those loving him and for those keeping his commands. And Jesus said, if you if you love me, you will obey me, which means that anybody who is not obeying Jesus does not love him. And no, that's why it says for those loving him and for those keeping his commands, because it's basically one and the same thing. If you love him, you're keeping his commands. If you're keeping his commands, you're loving him. Who gets the kindness? Do the people who are sinners get the kindness? No, because it's not kindness to send people to hell. God isn't being kind when he sends people to hell. Okay? And so that's why you you have to obey God to receive the kindness. The kindness is when God sends you to heaven. Okay? When you become one of his children, that's a kindness. But if you're a child of the devil, you don't have the kindness. You're not receiving the kindness from God. And ye have turned back unto me and kept my commands and done them. This is talking about repentance. If your outcast is in the end of the heavens, thence I gather them. So, so he's saying, if you, rep if you repent of your sins and turn back to me, I will gather you from the ends of the earth. He says, even from the ends of the heavens. So he's really, he's saying, even if the ends of the heavens, I'll gather them. And have brought them in unto the place that I have chosen to cause my name to tabernacle there. Now, in the physical sense, this is talking about Jerusalem. But in the spiritual realm, this is talking about heaven. Okay? And it's a promise to everybody who follows the Lord that they will be gathered even from the ends of the heavens to come to uh, the real heaven. I think it's a hyperbole. You know what hyperbole is? Hyperbole is when you deliberately exaggerate to make a point. And that's what the Lord is doing here. It's not lying. It's called exaggerating to make a point. It's a rhetorical device. So when he says the ends of the heavens, obviously people don't go to the ends of the heavens. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an exaggeration saying even beyond the ends of the earth. So God is exaggerating to making a point. To make a point that he will he will go to the utmost bounds to retrieve us from darkness and from eternal uh, judgment to take us to heaven if we only repent of our sins. All he asks is that we repent of our sins, and he will do the utmost to save us. Okay. <clears throat> and another example of. Um, a hyperbole is when you say, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. You're not lying. You're deliberately using hyperbole as a rhetorical device to make a point. And God has a right to use hyperbole just as much as we do. Okay. Jeremiah um, 35, 5 and 6. Lo, days are coming, an affirmation of Jehovah. And I have raised to David a righteous shoot. That's Jesus. And a king hath reigned and acted wisely. That's Jesus. And done judgment and righteousness in the earth. Okay. Righteousness is not wickedness. In his days is Judah saved. And, that, and Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And Israel dwelt confidently. And, and this his name that Jehovah proclaimeth him, our righteousness. 
Jesus is our righteousness. Because remember, Jesus has to be alive inside of you in order for you to live a righteous life. Because he is the righteous one. He is the one who never sinned and never will. If your flesh is alive, then you will sin. You're compelled to sin. But if your flesh is crucified, then Jesus through faith is alive inside of you and Jesus is always righteous and that's what keeps you from sin. I'm not saying that I can make myself stop sinning because I can't, because in my flesh I will always sin. But what I can do through faith is I can crucify my flesh and through faith believe that Jesus is alive inside of me because Jesus is the righteous one who never sins. So it's not works salvation, it's grace salvation through faith only. Because like I said, I can't make my flesh stop sinning and neither can you, neither can all those sinners in church. Nobody can make your flesh stop sinning, it's going to sin. That's why Paul told us we have to crucify it. That's why Jesus told us we have to take up our cross, which is the same thing as crucifying the flesh. We have to die to ourselves That's what Paul and Jesus were talking about, dying to ourselves so that Jesus himself can be alive inside of us. And it's Jesus in us who does not sin. He is the righteous one. Okay, I'm not the righteous one, but Jesus in me is the righteous one. And he keeps me from sinning because he's righteous, not because my flesh is righteous. My flesh will never be righteous. That's why it must die. (laughs) That's why Paul said my flesh must die. Okay, so Obadiah um, 1, 18 through 21. And the house of Jacob hath been a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they have burned among them, and they have consumed them, and there is not a remnant of the house of Esau, for Jehovah hath spoken. So remember, the fire of God is a holy, consuming fire, and it cleanses us. So Jacob and Joseph represent the... um, Israel, which represents the church, and Esau represents the world. Remember, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, because Esau represents the world. Okay, so those of the church have the holy fire. Okay, and the stubble, which is the world, gets cleansed out of us so that we no longer live in the world down here, and they have possessed the south with the the Mount of Esau and the low country with the Philistines. Remember, the Philistines were sinners, and they have possessed the field of Ephraim. Ephraim was a sinning tribe, and the fields of Samaria, they were sinners too, and Benjamin with Gilead. Benjamin tribe also committed some pretty bad sins. So he's saying that the righteous are now going to inherit the land of the wicked, okay? So in your temple, the demons get cast out of your temple so that now your spirit can inherit the land uh, that was once in, once oppressed and owned by the wicked, which is the demons, because you've repented of your sins. And the removed of this force of the sons of Israel, that 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 is with the Canaanites unto, and remember the Canaanites were not with the Lord, Zarephat, and the removed of Jerusalem that is with the Sepharad possessed the cities of the south. So the so the Jews that had been expelled from their land into a lands of evil now possess the cities of the south. And gone up have saviors on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdoms have been to Jehovah. So again, judging Esau means judging the wicked. Okay, this is a metaphor as well. So when the consuming fire cleanses your your soul and your spirit, then the world is cleansed from you and you repossess your land. You Your spirit takes over your temple. So now your temple isn't full of pollutants and demons anymore. Your temple is now full of Jesus Christ. This is a metaphor, okay? That's what it's talking about. So Jonah... Um, 3, 7 to 10. And he crieth and saith in Nineveh by a decree of the king and his great one saying, now this is the king of Nineveh who um, after Jonah had preached repentance and told him you have 40 days and then God's going to destroy you. So they all decided to repent, including the king. And man and beast, herd and flock, the king even commanded that the, that the animals 
fast in sackcloth. He, they didn't let the animals eat or drink for a few days. And that, that wasn't animal cruelty, because I'll tell you why. Because those animals were going to get burned with sulfur, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything was burned. So to save the people's life and the animal's life, they all fasted. Okay, they all fasted, including the animals, because it was to save all of them. Even though the animals weren't the ones who were sinning, they lived in the city of sin. So they had, so the king told them to fast too and cover them with sackcloth. Let man and beast and let them call unto God Almighty mighty, and let them turn back each from his evil way. This is repentance. Turning from your evil is repentance and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knoweth? This is the king talking. He doth turn back and God hath repented and hath turned back from the heat of his anger and we do not perish. So the king is saying, let's all fast and let's all mourn over our sin. Let everybody repent. Even the animals have to fast and put on sackcloth along with us. And who knows, maybe God will decide not to kill us. And God seeth their works. Now, this is not works of the flesh. This is works of righteousness, okay? That they have turned back from their evil way. They repented. So, so the people who cry, oh, work salvation, work salvation. Well, what is this? This is work salvation, but it's but it's the right works. It's not works of the flesh or pride. It's the work of repentance. So we do have to do a work in order to be saved. We have to repent. That they have turned back from their evil way, and God repenteth of the evil that he spake of doing to them, and he hath not done it. So this is saying that when the people repented, God did not destroy them. He chose to not destroy them when he saw that they had repented. So Nineveh didn't get destroyed at that time. So pretty awesome, huh? That means that you and I will not be destroyed in hell if we repent of our sins. That's a, that's a, a testimony to you and I. Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek Jehovah, all ye humble of the land. In order to repent, you do have to be humble because you have to admit that God is greater than you and that his ways are, are, be are best and that we have failed him and let him down and displeased him. And we have to be sorry. And all that requires humility. All ye humble of the land who his judgment have done. So, if, so the humble are the ones who do God's judgment. They're the ones who obey him. Seek ye righteousness. Seek humility. So righteousness and humility go hand in hand. It's the prideful who don't want to repent. It may be ye are hidden in a day of the anger of Jehovah. So again, Zephaniah is saying the same thing that the king of Nineveh said. He's saying, who knows? If we repent, maybe God will not uh, destroy us. And that's absolutely true. If we repent, we have a chance of God not destroying us. In fact, he promises not to destroy us. But if you don't repent, you have no chance. And that's why the king of Nineveh repented, because his only chance to avoid destruction was repentance. And that's my only chance and your only chance, too. So Hosea um, 2.19, and I have betrothed thee to me to the age. This is Jesus talking to the church and betroth thee to me in righteousness and in judgment and kindness and mercies. So if you're married to Jesus, who is the righteous one, you're going to be righteous too, because he won't marry a harlot. He won't marry a whore. He's not going to marry a murderer. He's not going to marry the wicked. Can you see Jesus being married to a whore? No, uh, -uh. he isn't going to do it. Jesus is going to marry those who are wearing the white robes of righteousness, just as the book of Revelation says. I know your pastor told you that Jesus will, would marry a whore, but he won't. He won't. He won't. So G G the bride of Jesus is also righteous. Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves in righteousness. Reap according to loving kindness. So if you sow, meaning if you plant the seed of righteousness, meaning you're doing the will of God in your life, then you will reap or harvest the kindness of God. Again, who gets the kindness which is going to heaven? Those who are righteous. The wicked do not get the kindness of God. Till for yourselves tillage of knowledge to seek Jehovah. This means knowledge of his word and his commandments. Till he come and show righteousness to you. 
So again, till, tilling the land, till for yourselves knowledge of his word, his commandments. So then he will show you righteousness. He will. That's how you learn to be righteous is by, is by learning the word of the Lord. Hosea 14, 9, who is wise and doth understand thee, prudent and knoweth them. For upright are the ways of Jehovah and the righteous go on in them and the transgressors stumble. So the righteous are the ones who who go on in the ways of Jehovah. This means the way of God is a way of righteousness. And Jesus said, I am the way and the life, the way, the truth, the way and the life. So what is the way? It's the way of righteousness. If you love, if you claim to be a Christian, then you have to be following the way. And the way is a way of righteousness, not sin. There's many Christians who go to church every week and they are not following the way because they're not following righteousness. The transgressors stumble. Most people who go to church are actually transgressors, and that's why they keep stumbling. So Micah 7, 18 through 20, who is a God like thee, taking away iniquity? Hmm, taking away iniquity, eh? That's what Jesus does. He takes away iniquity. He doesn't cover it up, and God doesn't turn a blind eye to iniquity. It's actually taken away and passing by the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. So he does forgive. This is talking about forgiveness, but this is talking about cleansing because he, he delighteth in kindness. Now, again, kindness is when he, 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 he has us enter heaven and enter the kingdom and become his children. So he wants to be kind to us, but that happens when our iniquity is taken away. And when our transgression is forgiven, he doth turn back, he pitieth us, he, us. he doth subdue our iniquities. And there it is repeated again. He takes our sin away, he subdues our sin. Same things as, same thing as um, remission. Remission means subduing, it means stopping, it means taking away. So he, he not only forgives us, as it says here, that he he passes by the transgression but he does way more than that because of jesus christ he takes away the tra the transgression he he passes by the past transgression and he takes away your present and future tra transgression he doesn't forgive your past present and future sins he only forgives your past sin as romans romans 3 25 says and then he takes away your present and future sin so you don't have to keep giving forgiven over and over for the same thing, he subdues your iniquities, and thou castest into the depths of the sea their sins. And again, this is this part's talking about forgiveness. So is this part, but this part is talking about remission, and so is this part. So we have in each in eighteen and nineteen, each of those verses is talking about forgiveness and remission, not just forgiveness. That thou hast sworn to our fathers from the days of antiquity, and again, it's talking about the prophets. All the prophets know this. All the prophets know this, that when Jesus comes, not only will we have forgiveness of sins like we always had when you repent, but those who repent and confess will also get cleansed and they will have their sins taken away and abated. Okay, and all the prophets told us this, just like the Bible says. And Nahum... 115, low on the mountains, the feet of one proclaiming tidings. And this is talking about Jesus, sounding peace. Celebrate, O Judah, thy festivals, complete thy vows, for add no more to pass over unto thee, doth the worthless. He hath been completely cut off. Okay, so there's two things I want to point out here. Peace between God and man can only happen one way, and that is when there is no more sin to forgive because the sin has been taken away. That's why the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to men when Jesus was born, because Jesus was born to take away our iniquity so that there could be peace between us and the father. We could finally have peace. When Jesus was crucified and he went down into um, Abraham's bosom in Sheol, um, he proclaimed peace to the captives. 
And those were the people who had always loved the Lord, but they didn't know the gospel yet. And so they were waiting in the bosom of Abraham. They weren't waiting in hell. They were wait. There's two parts of hell. There's the bosom of Abraham and there's hell. They weren't the sinners waiting, waiting in hell. They were those who loved the Lord, who were, who were waiting to know who their Savior was. And so Jesus went down and proclaimed peace to them and set them free. Peace means that you and God can now be family, that you can now be a child of God because your sins are not only are your sins forgiven, but you're not going to you're not going to sin anymore because now you're walking in righteousness. That's the only way that there can be peace between God and man, because God will never have peace with sinners. He will never have peace with with children of the devil. OK, he doesn't do that. He's God. <laughs> He does not compromise with sin. He never has and he never will. You can't have peace with him unless you stop sinning. Now, the second thing I want to point out here is for add no more to pass over into the, the worthless. He hath been completely cut off. The worthless are cut off, which means they go to hell. Okay. They're cut off from the family of God and they're cut off from salvation. They go to hell in the old Testament. In the older translations, especially, you will find that the whenever it mentions the worthless, it is always talking about sinners. And that is a fact in the Old Testament. The worthless means those who can who will who sin and won't stop sinning. Those who hate the commandments of God and won't stop sinning. Um so those who hate the commandments of God and won't stop sinning, they are completely cut off. But peace is given to who? Not the worthless. Peace would only be given to the righteous. Okay? It's only proclaimed to the righteous because the righteous can have a relationship with God, not the worthless. Haggai 2, 12 to 14. Lo, one doth carry holy flesh in the skirts of his garment, and he hath come with a skirt against the bread or against the pottage or against the wine or against the oil or against any food. Is it holy? And the priest answer and say, no. So, so God is showing them something. In, in the law of Moses, if you get your, if you get food dirty, like because you're carrying it in your skirt, which is like carrying it in your apron, and then you and you rub against things like you rub against dirty things and then the food in your apron gets dirty. It's not holy anymore. It's not sanctified because you got it dirty. They had rules they had to follow. The the sanctified food that went on the altar or that the priest ate or whatever had to be kept clean, you know? And so, yeah, if you get it dirty, it's not clean anymore. And the priest answer and say, it is unclean. And Haggai answereth and saith, so is this people. So that's an analogy. So is this people. And so is this nation before me, an affirmation of Jehovah. And so is every work of their hands and that which they bring near there, it is unclean. So, so Haggai was warning the people that if they, if they get themselves dirty with sin, they will not be holy people. And he is clearly telling them, holy means sanctified. Okay, holiness, sanctification, and righteousness all are like twins. Okay, they're triplet. They're like triplets. Okay, they all go hand in hand. So if you're holy, you're righteous. If you're sanctified, you're holy. Okay, um, but if you're, but you're unclean if you sin. And that's what Haggai is telling the people here. He's saying, you're all, you're all unclean. All of you are unclean. Because you won't stop sinning. Okay, so Abraham, Acts 3, 25 and 26. And here the Old Testament is being quoted. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, here's the quote. Through your offspring, which is Jesus, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So his servant is Jesus Christ. When God sent Jesus Christ, who's also his son and also God of God, of course, but when God sent Jesus Christ, Jesus um, 
blessed the people by turning them from their wicked ways. Look at that. Can you believe it? Jesus actually turned people from their wicked ways, and he still does that today. Now, why on earth would Jesus do such a thing? It's because the wicked go to hell. Jesus doesn't want any of us to go to hell, and that's why he turns us from our wicked ways. So if you're a Christian who gambles and smokes and drinks and fornicates and all that kind of stuff and watches dirty things in the movies and dirty things on TV and listens to dirty jokes, you are wicked. Okay? So um, Jesus, the ministry of Jesus is to turn you from your wickedness. And that goes to your for your friends in church too, because I think a lot of people who watch this channel really aren't living in sin. So I'm kind of talking to people that they they might know or might want to share the gospel with. And um, I just want people to just be serious about what the Bible says, because what the Bible says is serious. It's not a game. But but we're so brainwashed by churches telling us you know, week after week that, that it's all a game and, you know, you can, you can go through, jump through the hoops and go through the motions and fake out Jesus and fake out God, but you can't, you can't. God hates sin and he sees all your sin. He sees you naked in your sin. And he, he's not fooled by any church activities and church participation that you do. Okay. Zechariah three, four, and nine. And he answereth and speaketh unto those standing before him, saying, Turn aside the filthy garments from off him, the prophet Joshua. And he saith unto him, See, I have caused thine iniquity to pass away from off thee, so as to clothe thee with costly apparel. So Joshua was a prophet of the Lord, and he did seek the Lord. He had a lifestyle of seeking the Lord, but he wasn't perfect, okay? Um, because he was an Old Testament guy. And so... I have caused thine iniquity to pass from off of thee. Now this does, he's not saying I have forgiven his iniquity. He's saying he's, I've taken away his iniquity because that's what Jesus Christ does. Here I pray thee, Joshua the high priest, thou and thy companion sitting before thee for men of type they are. This means that they are showing, foreshadowing the, the Jesus to come. For lo, I am bringing in my servant a shoot, and this is this is Jesus. So there, there, they are types of Jesus, meaning not types as in the modern English sense, but types as in literary sense that they represent the Jesus to come because. They're walking in righteousness, not sin. For lo, the stone that I put before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Lo, I am graving its graving, an affirmation of Jehovah of hosts. And I have removed the iniquity of that land in one day. He didn't say simply, I have forgiven the iniquity. He said, I've removed the iniquity. And that's what, that's what remission of sins is. It's removing the iniquity taking it away. So here we have in two of these verses, God take Jesus. It's because it's, it's prophesying Jesus Christ is removing iniquity, taking it away, not just forgiving it while you continue to sin. First of all, you can never be forgiven until you repent. That's in every, every Old Testament book and every New Testament book. No one ever got forgiven unless they repented first. Look in the Bible yourself. You won't find one example of anybody in the entire Bible who got forgiven without repenting first. Never going to happen. Doesn't happen. That's not God's way. But secondly, after you've repented, the blood of Jesus Christ, if you really believe in him and follow him, his blood cleanses you from all iniquity so that you don't keep sinning. Because as Romans 3.25 says, he only died to forgive your past sins. He didn't die to forgive your present and future sins, as the pastors in church tell you, which is a total lie. Malachi, I'm trying to unbrainwash people. So <laughs> what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reverse the brainwashing. So I hope you're not offended, but I get a little bit excited about it because I feel like I have to yell yell at you a little bit because you've already been yelled at every single week with lies. And so I feel like I have to yell the truth. Malachi 3, 2 to 3. 
And who is bearing the day of his coming and who is standing in his appearing? For he is as fire of a refiner and as soap of a fuller. So Jesus is like fire. His fire refines. It makes us pure. Okay, that's what refining does. It makes us pure. So it means it, it cleanses us from sin. And he hath sat a refiner and purifier of silver, and he hath purified the sons of Levi, the priests and hath refined them as gold and as silver. And they have been to Jehovah, bringing nigh a present in righteousness. How can you bring a present in righteousness, meaning that your life is now righteous and you're presenting it before the Lord, unless you're first refined? Jesus cleanses the sin out of us, and then we can live the righteous life, and we can present back to the Lord a righteous life. But we have to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus first. Jesus is the only one who can do that. And that is the gospel. Okay? But first you repent, then you get refined, then you become righteous. Then you can give God your present of righteousness. He doesn't want church service. He wants us to present ourselves back to him righteous and holy. But we can't do that except through faith and because of the blood of Jesus. And, and it'll never happen before we repent of our sins. Anna the prophetess. Now, all these people are, are either called prophets or they prophesied at one point or another in their lives. Anna, Luke 2, 30, 38. And she at that hour, having come in, was confessing likewise to the Lord and was speaking concerning him. This is baby Jesus. She, she was confessing to the Lord and she was speaking about baby Jesus, who is also the Lord. To all those looking for what? Redemption in Jerusalem. Redemption means that we're added back into the family of God. And the correct definition of redemption, not the Billy Graham definition, but the real re definition of redemption that everybody knew before Billy Graham, is being freed from sin. Not forgiven in spite of your sin, which is what Billy Graham taught us, that you're forgiven no matter how much you sin. No, no one in the Bible was ever forgiven when they kept sinning. Everybody who got forgiven had to repent first. So that right there is a demonic teaching. You cannot be forgiven until you repent. But redemption is when you're freed from sin so that you no longer have that sin condition. The pastors tell you that you're born with a sin condition and you die with a sin condition. If you die with a sin condition, you're dying in your sin and you're going to hell. There are Most people will die in the sin condition, but not followers of Jesus Christ, not the children of God. They get freedom from the sin condition. Yep, you have to or you won't be righteous. There's no way to be righteous unless you get freedom from the sin condition. The sin condition is in your flesh. That's why Paul and Jesus told us to kill the flesh spiritually, not physically. But we have to die to ourselves. That's how we get freed from the sin condition. Dead men don't tell tales, right? So when your flesh is dead, it no longer is craving all these things. You know, it no longer wants food, sex, drugs, and everything. And, being popular and controlling others and having money because it's dead. That's why Paul told us to crucify it is because it has to, it has to be dead in order to stop sinning. It's going to always sin. It's kind of like a fish is always going to swim in the water, you know, um, because it's a fish. That's what fish do. Your flesh will always sin because that's what the flesh does. That's why you have to crucify. If you want to stop sinning, you have to crucify the flesh. You have to die to yourself. Okay, so Paul, Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have the redemption through his blood. Redemption again. You're back in the family of God. The remission of the trespasses, meaning that we have an abatement of our sins. We stop sinning. We get redeemed into the family redemption is when Jesus gets us back. We've already been children of Satan. We've already been children of the devil. But now Jesus has taken us back into the family and he's redeemed us. He's our kinsman redeemer. Okay, kinsman because we're co-heirs with him. Only because of his righteousness and our faith in the grace of his blood. 
according to the riches of his grace. Now, why on earth would it mention grace? Because grace is not forgiveness. Grace is power. Search the New Testament high and low, and you will discover that grace is not forgiveness. It's power. Now, in the church, they tell you grace is forgiveness, and you get grace no matter how much you sin. But in both the Old and the New Testament, you told you are told that nobody has ever been forgiven unless they repented of their sin. And that grace is the power that comes into your life that keeps you from sin. That's what the New Testament tells you. We need to start reading the Bible for ourselves and letting the Holy Spirit tell us what it says. Instead of going to church every Sunday and having an evil person who serves Satan brainwash us into thinking it says something that it doesn't. And I'm not trying to be mean to pastors, but most pastors are children of the devil because they they teach lies. They might look like nice men, but they're not being nice to you when they teach you lies every week. Peter, Acts 2, 3, and 8. And Peter said unto them, Reform and be baptized, each of you. Reform means repent. Repent and be baptized, each of you, on the name of Jesus Christ. To what? When you repent, you get remission of sins. That's the whole point of repentance. As the other verses have said, the whole point of repentance is that you get remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when so you get this whole package in salvation. Once you repent of your sins, then you're baptized in the name of Jesus because Jesus said tell all the, all the nations to repent and be baptized. Then he cleanses you from sin and takes your sin away so that you can walk in righteousness through faith alone, not through willpower, not through the flesh. And on top of all of that greatness, you you get to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You get filled with the Holy Spirit, but, but Peter here is actually talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is like a baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you actually receive spiritual gifts, um, like prophecy, teaching, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole package that comes with salvation. It isn't just one little measly forgiveness. And as I've said several times in this video, and I'll say it again, nobody gets forgiven without repentance ever, anywhere in the Bible. Um, but anyway, um, through Jesus Christ, we get abatement of sins and um, the gifts of the Spirit. So James um, 1, 21, wherefore, having put aside all filthiness and su superabundance of evil in meekness be re meekness is like humility in humility be receiving the engrafted word this is the commandment of god that is able to save your souls so again he's telling us to put aside all filthiness and superabundance of evil so he's saying repent of your sins and receive the word of christ james 4 8 draw nigh unto god and he will draw nigh to you Cleanse hands, ye sinners, and purify hearts, ye too, you double-minded, you too sold. So a, a double-minded Christian is somebody who really isn't a Christian at all because they claim to believe, but they don't, they don't act on what they believe. So they're double-minded. Um, they still have sin in their life. How do we draw nigh to God? If we draw nigh to God, he will draw close to us. If we draw close to him, he will draw close to us. But then he tells us how to do it. We have to cleanse our hands. We have to stop sinning. That's how we get close to God and he gets close to us. When we stop sinning, we we draw close to God and then he draws close to us. This is all very important. James 5, 19 through 20. Brethren, if any among you may go astray from the truth and anyone may turn him back. So if somebody turns back to sin and then his brother turns him back to repentance, let him know, the brother, that he who did turn back a sinner from the strain of his way shall save a soul from death. Death. Because when we sin, what we inherit is death. Okay? That's what we inherit. This last slide is actually a duplicate of the one up here. So I'm just going to go back to it because I can't click on the 40th slide. Um, it's a duplicate of this one. Acts 13, 39, and from all things from which ye were not able in the law of Moses to be declared righteous, in this everyone who is believing is declared righteous, in this one, Jesus Christ. If you believe Jesus Christ, you 
are declared righteous. But remember, we've already seen from the other verses that God doesn't declare the wicked righteous. He only declares the righteous righteous, which means you will become a righteous one with Jesus alive in you because Jesus is righteous. Let's go back to the this other verse. To this one, Jesus, do all the prophets testify. And we I just went took you through, I don't know, 36 prophets. That through his name, everyone that is believing in him doth receive remission, abatement of sins, stopping of sins. Their sins are taken away. Okay, just as all those verses said from all those prophets. I tried to look up every prophet I could in the Bible. Like I say, the three in the New Testament, it didn't really say literally what they had preached. So I didn't put them in here, but I tried to put in every single prophet I knew of in the Bible that had actually preached that their, his words were recorded in scripture. But, but with Agabus, um, Silas, and I think it was Judah, Judas, um, I couldn't find anything that they had actually said that was recorded, so I couldn't include them. And maybe I missed a couple others in the Old Testament somewhere that I overlooked, but I tried to get all of them just to prove to you that this verse is true. All the prophets told us that we must have remission of sins in order to be righteous. And all the prophets prophesied Jesus Christ as being that one who would give us remission of sins. It is the righteous who go to heaven, not the wicked. And God doesn't play games. If you're not righteous, he knows it. And he doesn't pretend. He's not a pretender, okay? He's not a pretender. So if you're not righteous, God knows it, okay? So we have to be righteous. And um, you can watch some more of my videos if you want to learn more about how to um, crucify the flesh and have Jesus alive inside of you. But anyway, God bless you. Sorry this was so long, but um, I have a point that the Bible is true and that what the prophets said is true. God bless.